Welcome to the Afghanistan edition of Coffee with Polio Expert. Um, today we have the honor to invite Dr. Hamid Jaffrey, who is the Eastern Mediterranean Regional uh, Director of Polio Program. Um, so today is a very cold winter's morning in Kabul. Uh, let's go and have that cup of coffee with uh, Dr. Jaffrey. So welcome, Dr. Jeffrey, to join us here in Afghanistan, in Kabul. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask you, because you spent last week in Pakistan and this week in Afghanistan, what is your experience here? First of all, it's really nice to be back in Kabul. I've come to Kabul after about uh, uh, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, and during this time, I was out of the polio program. So uh, my association with the program in Afghanistan goes uh, you know, back to its beginning. Um, I helped start the, the program here and did the first set of uh, surveillance trainings and uh, campaign uh, set up. So it's really good to be back and to see how strong the program has become over the, over the years since the mid 90s. But uh, obviously, uh, <clears throat> Pakistan and Afghanistan really are the only two countries now that have active transmission of wild polio virus. Uh, Nigeria, um, in fact, the, it's, it's expected now that by mid-2020, uh, the whole continent of Africa may be certified as, as polio-free. Um, and so we only have active wild poliovirus transmission in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So these two countries are under uh, intense scrutiny uh, right now globally. And uh, 2019 has been a really difficult year for these two countries and, and for the global program um, as well. But you know, these uh, when you get into these very difficult situations, it's really an opportunity which I think both countries have taken. Uh, and I was in Pakistan last week and it was my third trip really in the last three months uh, to Pakistan. And that program has done a lot of soul searching. They've done a lot of reviews, they've done a lot of assessments uh, to understand their challenges. And they really have a very, very sharp diagnostic now. What are the problems? And they're starting now to roll out the solutions to those, uh, to those uh, challenges. You know, both of these programs, Pakistan program and, and Afghanistan's program, are now highly mature uh, programs. And what I mean by that is that the teams are very well set up, teams are strong. We have a lot of experienced people. And uh, one very important operation, operational indication for me is that we are no longer at a stage where houses are being missed or villages are being missed during vaccination campaigns or we have large gaps in our surveillance system. I think those things are working. The fundamentals of the program are, are very strong and, and, and solid. I think where these two programs are struggling is when the vaccinators get to the doorstep, what happens after that? It's to engage the communities, to find all the children, especially the newborns and the ones that don't walk to the door themselves finding those children and then getting them vaccinated. And that dialogue with the families is breaking down, has broken down in some areas. And in some places there is very, uh, is, there's a very adversarial relationship between the communities and the, and, and, the, and the program. How can we change that? So I think community engagement right now is the topmost challenge right now in both of these, uh, both of these programs. And I think the solution to that is not just simply coming up with a new nifty communication strategy. Obviously, a good communication strategy is essential, but I think we have to look at the whole problem in its totality. Uh, it starts with, are the roles and responsibilities of the frontline workers clearly defined? Are the frontline workers adequately backed up by training, but a strong management structure so they don't feel like they are not supported and they don't, their back is not, the program doesn't have their back? And, um, uh, and one of the important recent developments is that the Minister of Health, uh, who's now leading the program, has uh, organized a um, advisory council um, of uh, respected members of all political parties to unify the political narrative around polio. So it's not a politicized subject anymore. 
um, and so all of the major political parties, even those that have a very adversarial relationship right now with the current government, have membership in this council so that they'll unite on the subject of, of, of polio eradication. So we're seeing political organization and we're seeing the programs management coming back together, partners coming back together, uh, restructuring uh, of the whole management structure of the program and then most importantly, an engagement with the community which is meaningful. Mm. That sounds like it's definitely the right, step, right direction to eradicating polio in Pakistan. Um, what about your trip here? You were just in Kandahar for three days. What was your experience there? Um, what is our challenges uh, there in Kandahar and in Afghanistan? So it was a, um, a very, as I said, a very reassuring uh, trip um, uh, for me. First to see the, um, how strong the program is now in the South. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, frustration uh, and in some circles hopelessness that, you know, there is a long-standing ban on house-to-house -house vaccination um, in the Southern region in areas controlled by the, by the um, um, anti-government um, elements. But this uh, visit to Kandahar has given me uh, a lot of hope, actually. And uh, in fact, I believe that uh, there are things we can do right now um, in the program that we can make a lot of inroads and get very close to uh, interrupting transmission um, in, in Afghanistan. Um, and you know, why I say that is that um, just listening to our field staff, um, even in areas where we don't have access um, and taking a deeper look uh, on the quality of the program in accessible areas, I feel that our number one priority is to fill the remaining gaps in the program in accessible areas. Because two of the most populous uh, areas which are important drivers of polio transmission in Afghanistan and particularly in the southern region are in fact accessible. Kandahar city is accessible. Most of the districts surrounding Kandahar city, Kandahar district itself are accessible. And then Lashkarga, which is the other big population center is also uh, accessible. And we still have substantial uh, program quality gaps in those, in those areas that are accessible. So I came away thinking that if the program can really fill those gaps in areas that are accessible, we can get very, very close to um, interruption of transmission. And we are going to be now doing a deeper analysis over the last 10 years to really get down to almost the sub-district cluster level to see which are the, what is the population dynamic that really identify those areas where transmission persists, secondly, where the transmission spreads to, and where outbreaks occur once it spreads and whether those outbreaks last very long or you only have one or two cases. And that way we can really target our strategy according to the epidemiology of polio. And as I understand the epidemiology right now, my sense is that if we can really start vaccinating those children that the program is missing now in Kandahar city, in the surrounding districts, in Lashkarga, in some of the parts of Uruzgan, uh, in parts of Helmand that are accessible, we improve our quality, we can get very, very close. And then we can fo focus on those areas that are currently inaccessible, but we could um, intensify our uh, other tactics and strategies we have, like the transit team, uh, uh, vaccination efforts like accelerating um, EPI uh, vaccination, looking at all opportunities of health facility to health facility vaccination uh, to maximize the uh, opportunities to vaccinate children in inaccessible area and that can get us very close and even potentially across. We of course have to make sure that in areas uh, where we are not relying on house to house vaccination that we organize EPI services, other health services, integrated services, so that we can start to attract those families that we cannot go to right now house to house. So that's very important. Now, three very important points why I feel we can really start to vaccinate these children that we are missing in accessible areas. 
For me, in Kandahar city in particular, I think the most important intervention is for us to get female frontline vaccinators and female uh, supervisors and, and female district polio officers uh, and even uh, more senior managers. Because what we are finding is that um, only 24% of the frontline workers right now are females and our social mobilization network, 47% of those are, are, are females. We need to really target to 100%. And what was very encouraging for me that it is in fact possible in Kandahar city. When, I, when we spoke to many of these stakeholders, it is very, very possible. And I spoke to some of the frontline workers yesterday, you know, vaccinators and the district uh, coordinators who were females. And they said, yes, when a male is registering uh, the number of children in a family, they don't completely register all the children. They, for them, it's hard to find out all the children who live in that house, particularly newborns. When a male vaccinator knocks at the door, it's very difficult for that male vaccinator to be able to count all the children in that, in, in that house. It's a very different story when a female is, is registering the children and when a female goes inside the house, talks to the mother, uh, develops some, a real healthy dialogue. Uh, and can address, because I don't think the resistance in most of Kandahar city, the refusal, is very hard. It's, uh, we just have to have a lot of people have refused because they felt that the, the profile and the behavior of frontline workers were not, was not very good. They were kind of put off by that. And um, so I think to me, the number one step that could be a game changer in Kandahar city and parts of Lashkarga is actually to get our frontline workers and our managers in the field to be to be women. I'm very confident we can do that and I'm very confident once we do that, we'll make a huge impact in terms of getting to the children that we are uh, missing uh, right now. Um, I think the um, other elements uh, of the program are fundamental, is you know the basics of uh, is the micro plan updated? Are we identifying new settlers who are coming in? Are we recognizing and counting and mapping the high-risk mobile populations that are moving? And are we vaccinating, uh, vaccinating them? So I think the micro plans, the quality of our frontline workers, the quality of our, our management structure, we can do it. This is all in our control. We can do that right now. And then those areas that are epidemiologically important and are inaccessible, those are the areas in parallel we can look at with really accelerating, making sure that the, dis, the, the health centers that are not functioning right now become functional, that we start, we work with the other partners, with the government, with all stakeholders to uh, um, re-engage these health centers that are not working to start providing medicines and services so that communities start engaging with these, with these health centers. Um, and then um, optimizing our other uh, strategies of transit vaccination and all opportunities to vaccinate children, I am quite confident we can make a lot of inroads uh, against polio even in the present environment. While we will continue, of course, to seek all opportunities to obtain access. We will dialogue, we'll maintain the neutrality of the program. We will continue to dialogue with all stakeholders, both through local negotiations, our staff, are excellent with local negotiations. They've already made a lot of headway uh, in areas where the vaccination was not allowed house to house through local negotiations. They are, they are, they are, um, they are doing that and that will continue. Uh, but I think that I feel a lot of confidence and hope that we can, we can actually succeed in Afghanistan. So why did you do the two country trips together? Because these two countries have a very long common border lot of shared populations and tribes, lot of movement. So the polio virus treats them as one geographic area. The polio virus does not know any, any, any borders. So these two countries have to succeed together. If one succeed and the other still has polio, inevitably it will infect the other one. So we need to succeed in these two countries together. And that's why the coordination between these two countries has to be absolutely flawless. And, um, and that's one of the areas that uh, uh, we are looking at very closely because there was very good coordination that has kind of gone down because of the challenges that the two country programs have faced. But I think now they're coming back together to improve their coordination. And I want to mention the important role of the GPEI hub. Um, 
that has been brought together to coordinate the provision of all GPI resources in a, uh, uh, from one place so that they are coordinated um, based on the country needs and then provided to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And one of the roles of this GPI hub is to in fact make sure that the hub looks at this as one block and on that make sure that the information exchange is solid, that the two teams come together regularly both at the national level but more importantly at the local level there is dialogue so that there is no children are falling through the cracks between the two uh, borders. Uh, so this uh, cross-border coordination and the inter-country cooperation is extremely important uh, for us uh, to succeed in interrupting transmission in these two countries. That is very encouraging news. It sounds like we are very close to eradicating wild polio virus. I think Emerald is now the only WHO region that's experiencing the wild uh, polio virus transmission for the uh, last three years. Um, when do you think we will end this? When do you think that we will be able to eradicate wild polio? My answer to this question is not in time, but in indicators of programs ability to succeed. Okay, so when those elements that I've talked about are in place, it shouldn't be magic. We can very quickly interrupt transmission. For me, um, as I've looked at these two programs, 2020 is going to be the year of the change, the year of the transformation. The transformative changes are very deep. They will take time to take hold and mature. So I don't think, I mean, we will be very lucky if we uh, succeed in interrupting transmission in these two countries in 2020. But for me, 2020 is to make the change and stabilize those changes and mature them. And then 2021, I'm hoping that all of these changes that we are talking about will be in place. The program can really ac accelerate to interrupt uh, um, tran uh, uh, transmission. Having said that, um, uh, there is different kind of volatility in both of these countries. Uh, in Afghanistan in particular, we are going through a lot of change. We are hoping that there will be ceasefire in Afghanistan, but you know, you, it's very, it's something that's even more difficult to predict for, than when we will interrupt uh, transmission. Uh, the elections have recently happened, there will be changes happening, and so there is a lot of volatility to this, so predictions are hard to make, but I'm still confident that with the changes that the program can make and will make, I, I am very optimistic that we can succeed um, in due course once these, all of these changes are in place. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, uh, you. Dr. Jeffrey, for joining us in Afghanistan today. Um, have a cup of coffee and tell us about the polio situation at the moment. Uh, it is very encouraging news that we are on the right track to eradication. So thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.